Well, welcome everybody um, to this uh, seminar of the Digital Humanities Research Group at the University of Western Sydney. Uh, we've got a very special guest speaker today, Dr. James Smithies, all the way from New Zealand. Uh, he's James is Senior Lecturer in Digital Humanities and the uh, Seismic Digital Archive Associate Director at the University of Canterbury. And James is a really well-known figure in digital humanities world, worldwide and, and, and a, a leading uh, figure in, in New Zealand, which has a number of innovative projects. Uh, Seismic is, is one of its largest and, and most, most advanced and a great model that, that many countries can learn from. Um, it responds to the, the catastrophe that is the Canterbury earthquakes um, and in, in 2010, and it's really a, a truly uh, multidisciplinary project. So, James is a very active member of regional and global digital humanities initiatives and he teaches digital humanities, the history of computing and the history of literature and technology. His scholarly work focuses on digital humanities, the history of literature, technology and ideas and New Zealand history. He's also worked in the IT industry in New Zealand and the United Kingdom as technical writer, business analyst and project manager. Please welcome James Smithies. Um, well, well, we'll jump into it. This is um, a project that developed after the Canterbury earthquakes. Um, the, the two major ones, but really they're an ongoing event that lasted for about two years. So this is a digital humanities pro um, project that was developed under um, no small degree of... Um, of we, had, we had many issues with it. It was part of an ongoing disaster management situation. Um, it's a non-technical seminar. I'm not going to delve into the, the technical specifics of the, of the archive. Um, and feel free to sort of raise a hand and, and ask questions if things aren't clear. But to kick off with, with the story, and this is all really, the Seismic Archive is about stories. It's about capturing the stories around the earthquakes for future generations and um, current researchers. Um, so the story starts on September 4th, 2010, when a 7.3 magnitude quake hit the city of Christchurch in the Canterbury region. It was only 10 kilometres deep. Christchurch is New Zealand's um, second largest city, so this is a, a significant urban setting um, for an earthquake to go off directly under it. And Christchurch was seen as a, a really unlikely place for a... a an earthquake to happen. The geologists were aware that it, it may well happen, but everybody in New Zealand was looking to Wellington and expecting the big one to happen in Wellington, not Christchurch. So that earthquake, the September earthquake, caused significant damage, but um, there were no deaths because it hit really early in the morning when um, people were still in bed. And there's this odd period between September and February where the people of Christchurch sort of felt like they'd dodged a bullet. And it's an interesting sort of discursive period, really. Um, they felt that the, the big one had hit and they'd gotten away scot-free and they could look forward to another 500 years of shake-free existence. Uh, that was until February 22nd, the following year, at 12.51. We'll see if we get audio. Just 
come in to check a couple of our family members, see if they're all right, got food and water. I just call it liquefaction, the, the ground basically li liquefied, it's uh, but partly because of Christchurch was built We're itself. really quite stranded really, um, roads are bad obviously. We've just come from Brisbane where they've had the floods and uh, I'm not sure which is the worst. But we're not really sure where we're going to go from here. <laughs> it rock and rolls again tonight and I'll uh, we'll think about leaving. Yeah, so that's to give you some context of, of the background, of, of what was going on in the background while we were, were building this digital humanities um, project. The earthquake that hit Christchurch on um, February 22nd was actually of lower magnitude than the September one. It was a 6.3. Um, but for a variety of reasons related to the structure of faults under the region, it hit with um, significantly more intensity and the, the epicentre was directly under the city, which was largely composed of old colonial brick buildings that, that catastrophically failed. Um, the peak ground acceleration uh, was one of the highest ever recorded. And people talk of hearing what they call the P wave several seconds before it actually hit and then intense noise and shaking. 185 people died in the quake, mostly in collapsed buildings or from falling masonry um, from, the, from the outside of buildings. 80% of uh, buildings in the central business district have been damaged beyond repair. 6,000 homes and entire suburbs have had to be abandoned. It's the third costliest insurance event in history. It was the second costliest until uh, the quake and tsunami in Japan a few months later. And uh, some economists estimate it will take 50 to 100 years for the region to fully recover. And the current cost estimates for the rebuild run at about $40 billion. The earthquake was followed by over 12,000 aftershocks of varying magnitudes, which turned um, what could have been an isolated event into an ongoing disaster that lasted um, probably for about two years, I think. And the, the city, as, as Harold knows after visiting, is still heavily damaged and the rebuild is expected to take 10 to 15 years. So, um, backstory to Seismic, I was working at the Ministry of Health in the IT department um, during both of the September and February quakes. Um, Paul Miller left his home in Christchurch because they had a, a sick child and um, no sewage. And we had a beer in Wellington and, and he asked me what an English professor could possibly do to contribute to the, this disaster management situation. The Canterbury geologists were on TV and doing their science education stuff and um, humanities academics felt a little bit innocent, I guess. So he asked me what, what could be done, and I put into the CHNM archive, the Centre for History and New, and New Media archive um, that was built for the 9 11 attacks on the World Trade Centre by some digital humanists in, in the United States, and I said, if I was you, I'd build one of those. Um, and to his credit, um, he went straight back to Canterbury and asked our Vice Chancellor, and for some budget, said we want to build this, and to his credit, our Vice Chancellor got back within 20 minutes and said, great idea, do it. Um, so I started working on high level requirements in my lunch hours and the evenings when I was at the Ministry of Health in Wellington. Got some high level requirements and a basic budget and risk strategy and comms plan together. Um, Paul got me hired as Senior Lecturer in Digital Humanities tasked with building this archive and then developing a digital humanities program. So we're in this situation. Um, I came down in July, August, and we sat around the table with um, stakeholders and, and basically asked, asked ourselves what we could do, what this archive would look like. And we found very quickly that um, it couldn't be a single siloed archive like the 911 archive that CHNN built. There were too many stakeholders and there were some groups that were already doing things at once. After the earthquake, there was a, there was a massive um, sort of crowd community response 
and whether it was digital or infrastructure or filling gaps in, 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 um, in the cityscape, projects grow up all over the show, and the same was sort of in the, it was the same case in the, in the digital space. So after assessing the situation, we ended up uh, building more than a single archive. We built a federated archive as well as a dedicated digital repository on University of Canterbury infrastructure. And we also brought together a consortium of national stakeholders to manage and contribute to the federation. And to keep things simple for users, we built this front end at seismic.org.nz and it has, um, this is the main front end, it has two other elements to it, Quake Stories and Quake Studies. Quake Stories was six weeks away from going live um, when we had our first meeting. It was built by the Ministry for Culture and Heritage and they were focused on crowdsourcing photos and user-generated stories to, to capture the stories around the earthquakes. Um, and so in our information architecture meeting, we sort of decided, well, that's covered, great. You guys can do that. Um, we'll build Quake Studies, which is designed to be a research-oriented digital archive. So this is designed to be the main portal to the collection. And funding permitting, we've got plans to upgrade it and make it sort of the go-to place for not just content around video, images, audio, etc., but also to be a place where you can go for... Um, APIs and do your data mashups and basically all the components that you might need to create digital stories around the earthquakes. So those are the those are the, sort of the front page of the two sites. Um, Quake Studies is for anyone that's interested is Fedora Commons uh, with a Drupal front end on it, um, and this is the the Quake Stories. .govt.edu site. There's about 650 stories in it, I think, and they're actually quite high quality. You'd think that people would just brain dump into it, but they didn't. They sort of edited their thoughts, and you get quite, quite well thought out stories. But um, now this talk is focusing on the um, the governance, the governance of the of the project. So seismic, um, the Seismic Consortium is led by the University of Canterbury and, in, and includes these stakeholders, these consortium members, but I'll read out the list because there's more than just those icons. Um, there's Christchurch City Libraries, the Canterbury Museum, the Canterbury Earthquake Recovery Authority, and that's CERA, and that was a government department set up after the earthquakes specifically for the rebuild. The National Library of New Zealand the Ministry for Culture and Heritage, Te Papa, the Museum of New Zealand, New Zealand on Screen, the New Zealand Film Archive, the Naitahu Research Centre, Naitahu is the local um, iwi, the Natural Hazards Platform, which is um, Geological Sciences, and Archives New Zealand. So what were our guiding strategies? Um, and this is all done on the fly. Thinking back, it's, you know, we're under a lot of pressure and everything was just done on the fly. And this strategy is the result of key technical people from a lot of those consortium members being thrown in the room and being asked, how are we going to do this? What do we do? Um, and so these are, these are the approaches. First, we decided you know, that we had to leverage existing national infrastructure. Um, that was for a variety of reasons. We, we didn't have a lot of funding. Um, New Zealand doesn't have a large amount of funding anyway, so most people working in, 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 in the, the, the space in New Zealand sort of feel a responsibility to make the most of what we've already got. So we wanted to leverage the exist, existing national infrastructure. We wanted to federate because that would help us knit everything together and it also create a sort of a, an organic um, ecosystem that we felt would be more robust. There's something about building a single silo that's quite brittle, and it's also difficult to force content into it. So you're dealing with digital content, torrents of digital content that's being created across multiple channels. The idea of trying to create a single silo of and in, in front of it all into that is, um, is problematic. Uh, we wanted to iterate 
and in terms of the technology approach, the approach to development, we decided we wanted to build quickly and then enhance what we've built. We wanted to build an ecosystem, and that ecosystem idea, um, I think, was quite crucial to bonding the consortium and getting buy-in to the consortium. There are a lot of um, conflicting user groups um, within this community for purely practical reasons, um, local versus national, um, individual WordPress owners who are sitting around the same table, metaphorically, with the National Library. I mean, how do you knit that together and get everybody to agree to, to share their content um, and apply open standards to it? The idea was that we've built an ecosystem and that allowed um, me to stand up and say that in an ecosystem the big trees are just as important as the small trees. Um, and by building an ecosystem we could ensure that if the small trees started to fail, if in five years time they couldn't afford to look after their servers, then the big trees could migrate, um, migrate to them. And that was where the Seismic Program team sort of fitted in because we put our hands up and say we'll take responsibility for the ecosystem. Everyone else is going to be responsible for their components of it, um, but we'll be responsible for the health and the value and, um, and the way that, that that community functions. So we're going to be the honest brokers in this. We wanted to engage with the community, and that wasn't, um, you know, what was, what was the reason for that? We wanted to engage with the community partly because we were in the library towers and <laughs> We didn't want to sort of create this impression of, of developing an imperialistic digital archive that was going to suck in content from the community for researchers to use. And that was the perception of the university um, within the broader community. It is in many places around the world, isn't it? So we saw this as an opportunity to actually get down to ground level, engage with the community and create some sort of meaningful cooperation. And that engagement with the community folds back into core digital humanities values, and that's what the digital humanities um, ethos sort of offered this project, because we didn't come at it from a pure research perspective. We wanted to enable research, but more than anything, because of the sort of the, the, the fevered nature of, um, of the context, we wanted to use digital humanities values to, to knit together a community and help Christchurch heal. It's, it's genuinely what we wanted to do, and we thought that um, safeguarding digital culture and telling our stories could, have, could help us do that. We also wanted to value and enable research. We're aware of too many instances where digital projects, digital archives have, have archived a lot of content very quickly um, without proper um, ethical procedures. Um, and, and as a result, the content that's in the archive isn't actually able to be used for research. So we, from day one, made sure that every single item, and there are around 90,000 items in there at the moment, every single item has a license attached and the researcher knows exactly what they can be used for. Um, and people also know exactly what they can be used for in terms of uh, mashup and reuse and, and all that sort of thing. Um, <coughs> We wanted to build an on-ramp to high-performance computing and um, New Zealand's data fabric. So that's part of leveraging the national digital infrastructure as well. We didn't want to build a silo of data that people wanted to research and, and had to um, download the data onto a hard drive and ship it across town and plug it into the HPC. So underneath the um, archive, there's an infrastructure layer that, you know, it's just implicitly building on University of Canterbury infrastructure that has a nice on-ramp onto the HPC. So one particular use case might be that we could um, export a data set from Seismic, um, put it on the HPC, run image analysis over it or some sort of automatic metadata retrieval um, software and then import it back in. And we wanted to embrace heterogeneity and I don't know where that came from, but I suspect it was just desperation. <laughs> You're sitting around the table it's like, how do we do this? It's all buts. But we use this standard and you use that standard, but this, we use this license and you use that license. So it's just, right, we're going to embrace this. Um, we're going to embrace heterogeneity of ontologies, schemas, systems, 
um, and data. And we're also going to embrace heterogeneity of copyright. So if you go to Quake Studies, you'll see all rights reserved, you'll see Creative Commons, and you'll see bespoke licenses. Um, and that goes back to our engagement with the community and with our users and that we sit down with them when they want to give us their data, when they'd like us to store their data and ask them what their needs are and say, so you know, we can accommodate whatever you need. We try and steer them towards Creative Commons, but it's often not appropriate. And again, we wanted to embrace heterogeneity of communities. Uh, we didn't want this just to be an ivory tower researcher project. And we didn't also um, didn't want it to be Christchurch and Canterbury focused. We wanted to view problems as research problems. Getting a project like this off the ground, all you hear are blockers. It's just can't do that, can't do that. Um, but being in a university context, it allows you to problematise it. So, well, okay, um, that's a complex issue, but that's what universities are for. Let's run a pilot. Let's um, create a paper out of that problem. So there are quite a few, instead of um, allowing those blockers to stop us, we'd spin them off into, into problems for further investigation. And we wanted to be in it for the long haul. Um, the rebuild's probably going to take, what, 10 to 15 years for the, the basic physical rebuild, but uh, you know, maybe 50 to 75 years for economic and who knows, culturally and spiritually. Um, so we didn't want to just collect for two or three or four years, we want to be there for, for 20 or 30 years. And, and I could say in summing up with strategy that on the whole that enabled us to be honest brokers, that strategy it made me feel like I could sit down in a room full of people with a lot of different stakeholder interests and a lot of them had you know, very sensitive issues. At the same time as we're having these conversations, people are dealing with broken houses, um, people who uh, have had injured or killed relatives. Um, this is a, quite a fraught situation. And this proved to be a powerful, honest way to um, approach the situation and build a technology solution at the same time. And it's informed by digital humanities values in large part. So the next thing um, to, to work out was governance. The strategy and our attitude enabled us to, to develop this governance model, which looks as overly complicated as it is, possibly. Um, but it speaks to the, the problems. Very, there was so much interest in this project that we, we had real, real issues with developing a a uh, workable governance model to um, help everybody within the stakeholder community. So that's what we, this work we put in place. Um, the consortium, UC Seismic Program and Program Board meets regularly and it provides the main governance forum for the consortium and it was initially um, comprised of chief executives from the main peak agencies within the consortium and that was I'm just remembering now, that was a key to getting this thing off the ground. We didn't get money from um, our peak, the peak agencies that were involved, but we got chief executive time. And that was <coughs> crucial to have that sort of brains trust around the table and working out how to develop it. Um, we never really used the advisory board as we should have. We didn't have the, um, the resource to really leverage it as we would have liked. But the advisory board was meant to be chaired by our pro vice chancellor, and it was going to um, include local business people and alumni who could help us develop um, long term funding and financial strategies. Uh, Tom, Tom Scheinfeld from CHMM is on it as well. Um, our research committee is quite active, though, and is a crucial aspect to this. We got pretty squirrely early on when we started to think about the human ethics and um, sort of research ethics component of this. Um, so we outsourced that problem <laughs> to a committee. And we had to, because we were building this archive. We had so much skin in the game, it was hard to, you know, it's hard when, when you get confronted with a really rich source of data to distance yourself and say, oh, no, 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 we can't have that. So what we wanted to do was outsource all those issues to a committee, which is chaired by our Dean of Postgraduate Research, 
and includes the chair of our Human Research Human Ethics Committee at the University, as well as um, a law professor. Um, we have, have an engineer and a range of people that can just be useful um, and, and help inform our, our ethical approach. Um, so they also disperse any funds that we have. We had $100,000 in research funding that the research committee dispersed and they approve our policies and processes. So the UC Seismic Program Office developed the ingestion protocols and the deed of gift and the consent forms, but it got signed off um, and they were heavily edited by the research committee. They also provide advice on tricky cases. We've had one of those just recently. Um, we'll send it off to the chair of the research committee and she'll either send it to the lawyer or the ethicist and come back with the advice for it. The seismic.org.nz, which is run by the seismic program, is the heart of, of the whole project. It's managed by Chris Thompson, who's an English um, PhD graduate with a background in TBI, um, who's interested in stylistics. Um, so he's very much a traditional humanities computing um, academic, digital humanities academic. Um, we also have a production coordinator who deals with, we have quite a lot of, we have a two year backlog of content, so we have a production pipeline um, that a production coordinator um, manages, and that allows us to align um, the ingestion and legal issues and ethical issues um, with technical release as well as communications and all the other stuff that needs to happen. And we have three full-time digital content analysts. Um, the digital content analysts are all humanities graduates as well. Um, and they're tasked with going out into the community or into the peak agencies and assessing their content. They'll normally do a risk assessment, a scope assessment, and, um, and then the idea is they bring the data back to the mothership and, and ingest it. And the office has student interns and, and research assistants sort of come and go as funding and projects permit. And the, the program office is um, sort of the heart of it, but they work closely with Digital New Zealand and Wellington. The Digital New Zealand team is um, a metadata aggregation team that works out of the National Library. Um, so we aggregate all of our data upstream into Digital New Zealand. Um, and the team work closely with Digital New Zealand to aggregate new content into the Federation. And the idea basically is, is that content um, gets identified by the seismic program team um, or people come to us and they act as a um, sort of shepherding system. If the content should, in their assessment, go to Te Papa, then they'll ship it off to Te Papa. If it should go to, um, if it, sometimes it would just sit out there in the wild and Digital New Zealand will aggregate it, federate it. But using Digital New Zealand means that at a community level, and this will become a bit more apparent on the next slide, we can use Digital New Zealand's policies and processes as well. Because aggregating stuff into a, into a research repository is one thing. It's sort of, there's sort of one gateway, and you can have processes that lead into that, and you can control it. But when we, the, the policies and processes for a nationwide community aggregated federation um, would, would have been very difficult for us to develop. So we're just able to use Digital New Zealand's content there. Um, go through. So this is the, the federated archive itself. And each of these nodes, as we call them, within the federated archive have their own policies and processes. So we've, we're not trying to, we don't um, exert policy um, control over the entire federation. In our memorandum of understanding, we basically say that Arch whatever Archive New Zealand gives to the Federation is based on their policies and processes and they take legal, ethical responsibility for it. Um, Quake Studies New Zealand, um, Quake Studies Canterbury um, ingests content from community sites and we take responsibility for those. Down the bottom, um, we have preservation. So Seismic, the Federated Archive, only um, claims to, our aim is for, to be archivists, 50 to 100 years 
ideally it will be there for a thousand years, but we're sort of aiming for 50 to 100. Um, we've outsourced preservation because, as most of you know, digital preservation is quite an, uh, a dark art. We've outsourced that to the National Digital Heritage Archive in Wellington, as well as Archives New Zealand, who are developing a government digital archive. And that was, that was partly out of necessity because we don't have those skills, but again, it was just fits into that model of using our national digital infrastructure as best as possible. <coughs> so this is the impossible to read slide. <coughs> and um, this is the, the current state of the seismic ecosystem. It's designed to be from the top. It's designed to be multi-channel. So those websites that you saw before, you know, they're just web front ends. We're more inter interested in the buckets behind it. Um, so it's not designed to be one website, but an ecosystem of data available on a variety of platforms. It's got four um, functional areas. By the way, it wasn't designed this way. This is the way it's evolved. Um, four functional areas down to the, down the left. Open access to all content in the Federation through Seismic.org, powered by Digital New Zealand. Um, community aggregation and access. So this allows us to bring in uh, blog posts. We actually aggregate Flickr carefully um, <laughs> because we don't really trust that it's going to be there in 50 years. A lot of sometimes we'll um, um, actually download the content that aggregate to Flickr different approaches here. TV3, TV and Z, we sort of trust that the, their content is sitting on robust infrastructure, so we'll just feed it in. Um, and different community groups and individuals. Down the bottom, this is sort of where the road, this is potentially a little bit flaky, this level here. But what do you do? You want to, you know, you want to, um, you want to federate and get as much content as possible, so, so we keep a watchful eye on that. Um, it might have to be brought into this layer at, at a later time, because this is the robust layer, this is sort of the big trees in the archive. Um, institutional curation, archiving and access through the major players um, in the consortium, and the University of Canterbury with the Quake Studies Archive that ingests um, Small community sites, but also um, large local government organisations, NGOs, and large community groups who don't have web, web archiving facilities. I'll show you a few examples of them later on. And over the other side, we've got our uh, four audiences. Uh, the world, because the seismic, seismic does sort of aspire to have a global audience, and looking at our web analytics, it, it does. So the people from Christchurch aren't that keen on looking at seismic. They just need to drive down the road. Um, and New Zealand public, and that's part of our community engagement, and is our core audience. POM um, is a, a, how do I describe POM? POM is a new initiative um, that's part of our ultra-fast broadband rollout and it's um, a digital content environment that teachers can build lesson plans out of. So we make, a eco make all of our content available on Digital New Zealand for sort of the New Zealand public to mix and mash, and mash it up, um, but it's also available on the POND network. And that's the idea of sort of multi-channel. It's just having those buckets there and then plug it in into lots of different channels. And our sort of one of our key success Indicators, I guess, is the number of channels that our content is available on, whether it's mobile or web or institutional. Um, and universities down the bottom. So research and preservation. NISI is our national e-science infrastructure, the data fabric and HPC, um, National Digital Heritage Archive, and RIANS is um, our fast research network. Uh, numbers, not that many really, I mean this isn't big data, um, it, it tracks at the moment um, with the Hurricane Katrina and 9-11 um, archives, sort of fits with 
with, um, with general digital humanities disaster archiving projects. Um, I don't know if I should go through this um, in, in detail, maybe the highlights. Um, we've, I don't know how much we've got of a backlog, but I know we've got two years of a backlog. Probably the key thing tonight, though, is that, um, is that Quake Studies has, that number's actually wrong, but Quake Studies probably contains 70% um, of the Federation as a whole. So Quake Studies, most of the content's going into Quake Studies. Um, you'll also note here that out of uh, that number there, we've got sort of a third of them are Creative Commons licenses. So that's, that's um, not bad. Um, we embargo some data, so if researchers come to us and say, um, I want to publish on this over the next two or three years, we'll embargo it for that amount of time, um, and then it'll tick over into public. Um, some content is, uh, might be sensitive, so we only allow researchers access to it. But the goal is open access, we make as much as possible open access. So, uh, constraints. The big constraint is that problem of scale, because you can see how complex that sort of diagram becomes. Um, you end up dealing with the complexities of scale more than the, the groundwork of what you'd like to do. And it really took us 18 months to put the system fully in place and be working at a BAU sort of workaday level where we were quite happily ingesting content on a daily basis. So even though I said our goal was to iterate, and get technology out there quickly and then develop it. We really didn't do that. The scale of the problem sort of overwhelmed us for probably about a year. Um, another major constraint is political will. So if you look at that um, ecosystem diagram, it's, you'd be hard pressed to find a minister who's going to take ownership of that. So we have trouble finding a business owner who can say, not just say, yes, we love seismic, we get a lot of that, but we, we can't find someone who will say, yes, that fits within my brief and I'm going to fund it and nurture. So that, that's difficult. Um, I've sort of touched on the problem of complexity. What it's taught to me is that um, you should forget the systems. That the, With a project like this, the, the, a good engineer and a good team of engineers can, can deal with the technical issues. The real problem is around um, the politics and the governance of the thing. And that can be solved by a good governance, good communication, and also solid upfront project definition and management. Um, so I basically use Prince2 for this as well as a, we use a little bit of Agile. But what I'm saying is that we use team, project management techniques that I learned in the commercial and government worlds and just apply them to this big, big project. Funding um, would solve a lot of problems. <laughs> <laughs> and initiation, um, getting it set up, um, getting the, having the energy to set it up in those first three months and really put some structure around it and, and, and get it up and going, that's probably the most difficult thing. The problem of time is an interesting one. And that um, seismic wants to be here forever. We want to be here for 20 and 30 years. In fact, we want to be here for 100 years. But the key agencies aren't. So the key agencies that were set up to manage the, the quake aftermath and the rebuild uh, you know, disappear in a couple of years. They're planned for obsolescence. Um, so again, you know, where's, where's our funding going to come from? And related to that is, is this issue where um, we've learned that knowledge about the data and where it is is as important as the data itself. So especially in our immediate aftermath of sort of three years after the quake, we're going through a triage process, and a lot of, we try and get as much as possible into the archive itself, but there's a lot of value in actually just knowing where all the data lies. There are a lot of people out there who... Um, Seismic is probably the only program in Christchurch that has an interest in every single type of data, whether it's GIS or cultural heritage or sensing city stuff. We're interested in all of it. Everybody else is just interested in their little component. Um, and funding and sustainability. We're seeking funding for 2015. I'm pretty confident we'll get that. Um, 
should that be in capitals? Yeah, it should be. It should be. Yeah, it should be. It's it's a bit. It feels a little bit touch and go, but there's just so much momentum now that it's clear that we're going to carry through for another couple of years. But we need to find a way to make seismic um, fully sustainable. And the analogy that I draw is with the Napier Museum. So in 1981, there was a big earthquake in Napier in the North Island. And if you want to research that museum, you go to uh, research that earthquake. You go to the museum. You go to a physical place. Um, but for some reason, because Seismic is a digital museum, it doesn't have the same standing. People can't grasp um, the, the need to keep it around. Um, we've got a little bit of time to show you some content. It's been a bit dry, sorry, the, the governments and the strategy, but um, I think that's, I was thinking that's what um, we'd be interested in. Let's look at a bit of content. Um, this is a content selection, the stream of content from one particular building. Uh, it's the Press Building, which is our local newspaper at 32 Cathedral Square. Um, so our goal was, um, it, it was really just to create a bucket that other people could use to mash up. And ideally, that, that's because most of the damage in Christchurch was to the built environment, we, we sort of realised that we wanted to create a system that would allow as much content as possible to be tagged to specific places and buildings, because then developers can come along and create stories. So this image was given to us by Fairfax Media, um, who are pleased to give us all of their published and unpublished earthquake content, and they've given us tens of thousands of items already. Um, this was as the quake was happening in the press building, as it was falling down, and you'll see pictures from the outside. Um, and realised that the scope of a, a journalist in true journalistic fashion started clicking as soon as the earthquake happened. Um, but we were working, we were working with people who, who were um, in this building. So this is a, still happening. I think two or three of these were published in the paper. We've got 3,000. Um, this is Al Nisbet. Um, who's a cartoonist, so just remember him. This is um, him getting out from under his desk after the quake. They exit the building. That sort of looked like they were, I believe they were up in there. Um, so you just saw the, the building, the, the roof collapsing. Um, they're quite a historic building, as you can see. Um, we've got the newspaper, so we gave us high um, definition PDFs of each of the, the newspaper pages. They're full text searchable. Um, they're all available. This is available through the National Library, the sort of largest seismic federation, and it's one of Alan Nesbitt's cartoons that unbelievably he got straight back into his cartooning, went back to work, and he was writing cartoons a couple of weeks later. These are the blueprints for the press building that were given to us by an engineering company. Um, after the earthquakes, a lot of the survival teams, um, USAR and what have you, were desperate to get engineering blueprints. Um, Paul Miller had been arguing for them to be digitised years before the earthquake. Uh, they all had to go to the physical museum and <laughs> get them out. Um, but we've been given some um, electronic blueprints. They're massive files, by the way. Um, and we've also got in the Arms and um, Collins collection the original architectural drawings for the building. Um, we worked with the HIT lab, the Human Interface, Interface Technology Lab at the University of Canterbury on their CityView AR app, which is a, a mobile application that allows you to, it takes over the video camera, you hold it up to where a building was and it projects and augmented reality version of the building. Um, we got an intern to write, um, we provided additional content, um, including audio interviews, some of the, con the images from, from inside the building, um, and we had um, an intern write some little historical snippets for the buildings. The historical pictures of that building are obviously available through the Federation as well because the National Library is part of the Federation, so they could all be available. Um, after every building, or as every building was demolished, the New Zealand Historic Places Trust sent in an archaeological firm who documented 
the deconstruction and then did a full archaeological dig of, um, of the foundations and all of those reports are in quake studies. Um, strangely enough, when a building that's on a historic places trust register falls down or gets demolished, the documentation for that building gets taken off the public online register, so that sort of the, the public suddenly couldn't access it. So New Zealand Historic Places Trust asked us to take those documents and store them in quake studies. So they're available as well. That's the, the register record for it. Um, and that's, I guess, my representation of what we hope to save in, in the future, which is um, uh, the, the future of that precise the cathedral square. Um, so I guess that gives you a, a bit of a deep dive into one particular content channel. Um, but if you, you, know, you say that the 86,000 items, what's that? Well, we've just looked at sort of what, 10 or so there. Um, there's real rich veins that could be mined um, and mashed up to create stories in the future. Um, I'll give you, a, a, I, think this, I won't actually play these. A um, couple of other interesting things, projects that happened, um, the Quake Box which was developed by uh, um, the Institute for Language, Brain and Behaviour, a linguistics team. They sh worked with us to kit out a container and we shipped it around the community and people would just walk in off the street and, and tell their stories. So we've got 750 of those and they're all transcribed by humans. So we've got very high quality full text transcriptions as well. So potentially, I don't think um, Debbie Lee does actually talk about Cathedral Square, but the idea is that we've got those full text transcriptions. There's no reason we can do some sort of entity extraction and, and add that to the story of 32 Cathedral Square as well. And as a last sort of random one to show you some of the random content that we've got, this guy turned up and um, he decided that he'd do some drone flights. He had a private drone and he attached a video camera to it and he was doing flights, GPS automated flights around around the city. So we, we've got those as well. Mm. So that's, that's the size of the project. Mm.